Let's take a look at Newton's second law of motion. Uh, some of the forces equals ma. We want to transform this for use with Newton's uh, uh, for use with rotation. So we need Newton's second law of rotation, and we can use rotational analogs that we've talked about uh, to cause motion. We have a force to cause rotation. We have a torque, so we replace force with torque. Um, resisting changes to motion is mass or inertia. Resisting changes to rotational state is rotational inertia. And acceleration, angular acceleration. And so sum of the torques equals I alpha. That is Newton's second law for rotation. Let's apply it to some examples. And when we apply it to examples, we're going to be using the rules of free body diagrams. And so it's pretty much the same thing we did before. If you're not going through these steps and you're having trouble, that is why. And so first draw the object as simple as possible. Draw and label all the forces acting on the object. But now we're going to have to be careful and make sure the force, our arrow, originates at its point of application. And weight vectors start at the center of mass of the object, or the geometric center for our purposes. Then we indicate a coordinate system for rotation. It's going to be a little twisty arrow like that or like that, depending on whether you want clockwise or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is usually positive. And then we write Newton's second law for rotation. And sometimes we also have an object that's in linear acceleration. And so we have to look at it as well. And we solve for the unknown. So let's use this process to solve some examples. So first, we're going to start out simply. We have a mass on the end of a stick that's free to rotate about a point here. And if you want to see it, here it goes. And so we let go, and it falls. What we want to know is the angular acceleration of the rod uh, right when I let go, and then the linear acceleration of the end. And so what is the linear acceleration of the end, and what's the angular acceleration right after I release it in the horizontal position? And so we draw the object as simple as possible, but now it's got to be an extended object so we can show lever arms. And there are two forces on it. There's a normal force from the pivot, and then there's weight. And we're neglecting the mass of the meter stick, so the weight is just from the clay. And notice it's coming right from its center. Indicate our coordinate system, a little twisty arrow showing counter, uh, clockwise is positive, not counterclockwise, because that's the way it's going. So why make it negative? Write Newton's second law for rotation. So if you write that, you're going to know it. You skip that step and then wonder why you don't know it. Uh, it's because you're not writing it out when you need it. Some of the torques, well, it's just the force times the lever arm. And so this has a length L. And so the weight is perpendicular to that. So it's force times lever arm. Don't forget the lever arm. And the rotational inertia, this is, we're just considering this as a particle. So it's mr squared. And so I of a particle is mr squared. Uh, I know I can treat this as a particle because they didn't give me the dimensions of this object. Otherwise, I'd have to use parallel axis theorem to figure out uh, what its rotational inertia is. Um, but we don't have to. It's just a particle. And solving for alpha, it's g over l. And then what was the linear acceleration of the end here right as I let go? Well, a is alpha r. That's a very important equation that's going to come up over and over. Make sure you know it. We've seen it. We've used it. Make sure you know it now. And so the end, r equals l. And so we just get the acceleration as g. So nothing really uh, different here. It's almost the same as just dropping something. The key thing, though, is this acceleration will not stay the same. This is going to change, and this is going to change. And so let's look at it uh, at some other position rather than horizontal. So now we have the uh, clay at an angle, or the meter stick at an angle. I'm going to release it. And I want to know the angular acceleration of the rod and the linear acceleration of the end. And so we draw our object as simple as possible, draw and label all the forces. 
some of the torques about the rotation axis. And notice last time uh, the normal force didn't have a torque, doesn't have a torque here. There's no lever arm. And so summing the torques about a place where there's a force makes it so it doesn't show up in our equation for Newton's laws for rotation. So sum of the torques equal I alpha. The torque is the perpendicular component of the lever of the force times the lever arm. And so we have to figure out the perpendicular components. And so if we extend the lever arm here, this is the perpendicular component of the weight. And so what's this angle here? It's got to be theta. Um, as this angle gets smaller, so will this one, where you've got two parallel lines cut by a diagonal, right? And not a very good diagonal, but you get the picture. And so make sure you can come up with uh, that this is theta. And so the perpendicular component, which is the only part that has torque, is opposite that, so we have sine theta. And we can solve for alpha. We get the same thing we had before, except we have the sine theta here. So if theta is 90, sine of 90 is 1, we get the same result we had before, g over l, and this is for any other angle. It also makes sense, what about the bottom? If I let it go at the bottom, will it move? No. And so there's no torque at sine at, at 0 degrees, sine of 0 is 0. And then the acceleration, same thing, a is alpha r, make sure you know that, g sine theta over l, of the end of the stick, r equals l, and so we get g sine theta. And if you want to see it, not that spectacular. So it's different. So one thing you have to watch, if they ask for how fast is it going at the bottom, you would not use your accelerations and kinematics equations for that. You want to use energy. But we're not looking at that now. We're just looking at Newton's laws solving for the acceleration. Uh, let's do a quick review of the parallel axis theorem. Uh, we're going to need it for the next problem. Well, maybe. And so the rotational inertia of an object is its rotational inertia about the center of mass plus a correction term, mh squared, where h is the distance from the center of the object to the rotation axis. And so what about a rod rotating about its end? Well, if I'm given what it is about the center and I know the parallel axis theorem, I can solve for that. And so if it's rotating about its end, what would h be? The distance from the rotation axis to the center. And so if it's got a length l, h has got to be l over 2, right? And so h is half the length. So a rod about its end is what it is about the center, plus this correction term, l over 2. And simplify, get a common denominator. I can multiply this by... Um, 3 over 3, and so I get 3 twelfths plus 1 twelfth, 4 twelfths, or 1 third ml squared. Uh, so that is a rod about its end. Now we're going to use that in the next problem. Now we don't have the clay on the meter stick. And so we're just going to let go, and the rotation axis is there on the left end. And it's going to fall. What is the uh, angular acceleration and the linear acceleration at the end? Now the weight vector is in the middle. It's not on the end for every little bit of mass here. There's a little bit here with less torque. And so if you average the location of the lever arm for both these little pieces of mass, it comes out to the middle. And that's true for any point. What about that little piece of mass here? It has a lever arm of 3 fourths the length. Well, there's another little piece here with a lever arm 1 fourth. Average those together the weight is at the center. And the normal force is here, where the pivot is, but we're going to sum the torques about that point. So no torque from the normal force, just the weight. So sum of the torques equal I alpha. Rotational inertia, again, we just went through all that, is one-third ml squared, so you can review that on the previous slide. And so I know I about for a rod about its end, the torque is mg times L over 2. It is perpendicular when it's horizontal, so we don't need the sine theta here. And then I is 1 3rd ml squared, and so the m's go, one of the l's goes, and we get alpha is 3 halves g over L. And what about the linear acceleration of the end of the rod? Remember, different points on the rod have 
different linear accelerations, but the angular acceleration is the same for every point. That's why it's useful. And so the linear acceleration, A is alpha R, the end, R equals L, I get 3 halves G, 14.7. Wait a minute. Can it, the acceleration be greater than 9.8? Well, let's check that. How would we check it? What if I drop something here, right when I let go of this, if this has a bigger acceleration, it should outrun it, at least at first, because we know the acceleration gets less as it rotates. Well, let's test and see. So I've got a meter stick, and I've put coins on it every five centimeters from 50, 55, 60 on out to the end. And let's release it, and if the end is accelerating greater than 9.8, we should see it move away from this coin. So here it goes. Oh, we hit the coin, but I think you can see that they did move away. And you can see that the next coin in also has an acceleration of 9.8, but the ruler at least initially had a greater one. And all the way into here. And so at some point, the coin stayed on the meter stick. Can we figure out where that is? So in other words, at what r, what distance from the pivot, does the acceleration equal g? And so we have an equation, uh, a is alpha r. We set A equal to G, and from our previous work, we know alpha is 3G over 2L, and now we solve this for R. Before, we set R equal to L and solve for A and got uh, 3 halves G. Now we solve for R, and we get 2 thirds L. So it's saying at about the 67 centimeter mark, the coin would stay on the ruler. So this one was on 50, 55, 60, 65, and so pretty close. Let's take another look here. Pause it. So right there, at least initially, um, it did stay on there. So this is the 70, that's the uh, 65. And so pretty cool. Now let's combine the clay and the meter stick. So we ignored the mass of the meter stick in our first example. Now we're gonna get the real acceleration. And so now we're going to kind of combine two of the examples we did. We have the weight of the clay and the weight of the meter stick, which we put in the middle. And then there's a normal force, but we're going to sum the torques about that point so the normal force doesn't show up in our torque equation. So now we have two torques. So we write Newton's second law for rotation. Sum of the torques. That tells me I have to add all the torques together equals I alpha. And the torques, we've seen this already. The torque from the weight of the meter stick, mg times the lever arm, which is L over 2. And then plus mgl, they're both in the same direction. They're both perpendicular to the lever arm. That equals I alpha. I is 1 third ml squared for the meter stick. And the clay is a particle, mr squared, where r equals L, and alpha. And we are assuming the meter stick and the uh, clay have the same mass for simplicity. And so this simplifies greatly. The M's cancel. One of the L's goes. And I'm left with 3 halves G equals 4 thirds um, L alpha. Solving for alpha, I get 9G over 8L. And if you want the linear acceleration of the end, A is alpha R, R is L. And so I get 9 eighths G. So if I did put a coin on here, it would come away a little bit, but not as much as just the meter stick by itself.